Welcome to Rising Together, a podcast on the art and design of inclusion. I'm Dr. Elson Haskeller. And I'm Curtis Anderson. Each month, we'll have a special guest, and we'll learn from their personal stories and experiences about how to create change. From thought-provoking discussions to real-life strategies, we'll explore the transformative power of inclusion and discuss how to create a world where every single voice matters. We hope you can join us as we dive into the art of creating inclusive communities. Let's embark on this journey of transformation one story at a time. Stay connected, stay engaged, and more importantly, keep rising with us. If possible, don't think about if your work is gonna sell commercially, because I think art is a great channel to educate others. And through art, you can express what you can't with words. You can catch the latest episodes of Rising Together on the first of every month on Spotify, YouTube, or your preferred streaming platform. Welcome to another episode of Rising Together. Today, we have the privilege of welcoming Mara Torres Gonzalez to the show. Mara is an artist and a gallery curator from Puerto Rico. In 2020, in the middle of the pandemic, she opened Mara Art Studio and Gallery in downtown Sarasota. Mara collaborates with local and international artists from all around the world, ensuring that their voices are heard on a global scale. Welcome to the show, Mara. Thank you for having me. So good to have you. Yeah, could you tell us a little bit about who Mara is? Mara is a Boricua, Puerto Rican. Mother, wife, sister, daughter, granddaughter. And I mention that because uh, in Puerto Rico, it's all about family. Uh, it's part of who I am, mainly. We celebrate everything in family. We're always together. Uh, I have a grandmother who's turning 100 in June. Wow. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, I have uh, very supportive parents and I have the most amazing kids. Um, I, because of my supportive parents, I was signed up at the Student Arts League in Old San Juan when I was almost four years old. So I was actually admitted before the minimum age requirement of four. Wow. Because they saw certain skills and talents. Uh, they said I was always creating something in the house whether out of cardboard, I would be putting stuff together. And as the youngest of the group, I, one of my pieces was admitted into an art exhibit. After I graduated from art school, that's when I had a transition and opened my first business. That was back in 2001. And the business developed into one of the main design firms in Puerto Rico. I had the privilege of being selected to design the wedding of NBA player Jose Juan Barea from Dallas. Oh, wow. How was that? Oh, that was amazing. <laughs> uh, and then marrying uh, Miss Universe Puerto Rico, Viviana Ortiz Pastrana. So I would say that's one of the highlights of my design career and also a partnership with celebrity designer Preston Bailey from New York. And that was in, back in August of 2017. You, you sh shared with us um, this painting, you know, that you created when you were three years old, and that's absolutely, you know, breathtaking and and, and unbelievable that a three-year-old could, you know, could could do that. Um, when you look back, you know, at all of the projects that you you know worked on, what has been the most meaningful project that you worked on or collaborated with somebody? As of today, the most meaningful project has been. 209, which translates to September 20th in Spanish. So we do the day before the month in Spanish. And that is a series inspired by the, mostly the aftermath of Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico. So immediately as we were able to open the front door to our house, uh, we encountered a completely new landscape scenario. It was as if they just moved our house into a war zone. Everything was gray, all the trees were down, was no power, uh, no phone, 
So you had no idea what was going on beyond what you were able to look at. We couldn't even leave our neighborhood because the trees were blocking the one and only exit. So we had, all the neighbors had to get together and get the trees out of the way so we could get out. And that's when it all started. When I saw all the devastation, I started documenting with photography. And uh, I did a lot of documenting in San Juan, but then I also went to the rural areas, the smaller towns, and did uh, more documenting in photography. I had the opportunity of, move, of moving my son out of Puerto Rico uh, through the military base, and he moved to my sister-in-law in Colorado. And that's where I started working on the paintings, the encaustic paintings in Colorado. So I was traveling back and forth, Colorado, Puerto Rico, working in Colorado, working in Puerto Rico uh, on the series, mostly encaustic pieces. So I had to, when in Puerto Rico, connect a generator to be able to turn on the hot plates. When I was in Colorado, I could just work on, on anything. And a year, exactly the same day, September 20th of 2018, I had my opening night of the 209 exhibit in Puerto Rico. So talking about that project, you know, and then who you are as, you know, an entrepreneur, a boss, right? Can you bridge the gap a little bit? Like how did that inform or shape the creative or the person you are like today? How does that, you know, how does that develop or shape your story moving forward? My 209 series? Yeah. So I lived through the hurricanes, both Irma and Maria. And I lived and experienced a humanitarian crisis in Puerto Rico, uh, mostly caused because of the lack of response or the slow response of our local government and the federal government. How has this shaped me? It gave me a new perspective on how us Puerto Ricans, US citizens are not treated equally. Mm -hmm. The response was way slower than any other response to a big hurricane here in the United States. Moving, then moving out of Puerto Rico into Sarasota, I experienced diversity because in Puerto Rico, you are surrounded mostly by Puerto Ricans or Americans. So I experienced diversity because there's people here from all over the world, and that is a great thing. But I also have experienced how we are not seen or treated equally, even though we are American citizens. We are born, and the moment we're born, we are US citizens, just like anyone born here in New York, in Massachusetts, in Florida. We are U.S. citizens, but we don't have the same rights as U.S. citizens. For example, in Puerto Rico, you pay local taxes, but you also have to pay for federal taxes. But then you don't get to vote for president, right? A hurricane, as Hurricane Maria, devastates Puerto Rico, and we don't get the same response as the U.S. citizens living here in the mainland. One of the things that I get asked a lot is, when do you become a U.S. citizen? How has it been since you moved into America? Which, of course, I moved into North America. I moved into the United States, not America. I also get asked a lot, where did you, when and where did you learn to speak English? back in Puerto Rico, not here. Uh, the most frequent question I get almost on a daily basis from customers walking into the gallery, as soon as I start talking to them or greet them, where are you from? Because of my accent. Mm -hmm. And I don't ask customers when they start speaking to me, I never ask, where are you from? 
So it feels like an invasive question to you. Because um, I also, you know, have an accent and, and you and I were talking about it. You know, if I go to a coffee shop trying to order coffee um, and just I just want to go about my business day, you know, sometimes like in my life, people have grabbed me by the arm and they're like, where are you from? Yeah. Um, and, and, and that sort of felt invasive to me. Does that feel invasive to you? It is invasive because I, I'm not asking you, where are you from? I'm just talking to you as I would love for you to be talking to me. Why does it matter where I am from? If I didn't have an accent, you wouldn't be asking where I'm from. Mm -hmm. I could, I, I could, I could totally relate to that. Um, I moved to the U.S. like when, as you know, when I was younger. So it's been about 25 years, and I do feel like Florida is my home. And I have two kids, um, and they're Floridians, and um, you know they're going to be, you know, raised here. And I, and I, and I love this place that I call home. And um, when I just want to go about my day, and people are, you know, asking me, or I get, you know, asked daily 20 times, "Where are you from?" It makes me feel like I can never, you know, I, I don't belong here or I could never be a part of this, you know, amazing, beautiful space that I call home and I'll always be an outsider. Does that make you feel that way as well? Yeah, completely. And then we try so hard to belong and we feel like we are never going to belong. So going back to like this, <clears throat> this like shaping of who you are, you know, culturally after you moved here, like, was, did you have this inkling or was like this sense of, I don't want to say sense of belonging because you're in Puerto Rico right after you finished school up until you moved here. So there, like, who was Amara like, as a creative, as an artist pre-hurricane? Because it sounds like the hurricane came in, shaped you, and then sent you on this path towards, you know, moving to Florida, which has then wrote another chapter in your book. So like, what's the difference between the post hurricane coming to Florida and in pre hurricane artistically for you? So I have always been an artist, uh, whether I was painting or designing events. I designed and I performed. I did all of the flowers, all of the centerpieces. I took care of everything with my own hands. Of course, we had employees, we had staff that would help us put everything together, but I was the one designing and putting everything together. So I have always been a creative. Um, I started the business making handmade paper and making wedding invitations. Wow. That's how it all started. I had a planner, receive one of my invitations and just reach out to me and can I order invitations for my customers from you? That's how it all started. So I have always been a creative person throughout my entire life. Hurricane Maria, what did was it completely uprooted our lives. If Hurricane Maria wouldn't have happened, we would still be in Puerto Rico. Um, you mind if I interject with a question, another yeah. question just about the, your, that project that, I mean, I feel like if someone was writing a book about your life, like this would be a turning point in the, your life. It was a turning you point. You know, what was, what was your favorite piece that came out of your, your, uh, your book? It could be the book itself, but like, I mean, you open your door, Puerto Rico is not what it was before you, you know, the storm came. I've seen the piece with the toilet papers, and I was wondering if you can tell us about that. So those are not my favorite pieces, but it could be one of my favorite stories behind the pieces. It's more than one piece. So if I remember well, two weeks after the hurricane, very early October, so we had no power, right? No phones, no communication. I'm stuck in the middle of like heavy traffic, right? N nonstop, like you're just in parking, you're parked. Later I found out that the reason for that is they had the roads closed because President number 45 at that moment, President Trump, uh, was uh, in a press conference in Puerto Rico. So he flew in two weeks after for a press, very brief press conference uh, 
and he was throwing paper towel ro rolls to the crowd, literally. There's videos online if you want to entertain yourselves. We had no running water. We had no power. We had no food. Because when I went for the first time to a grocery store with my kids, we had to wait outside an hour and a half in line. And when we walked in, the shelves were empty. There was barely any food to buy. So I, I still wonder what was he thinking we were going to do with paper towel rolls. So it just blows my mind. So a lot of the pieces uh, have cutouts from the, from the rolls. But I think going back to your question, my favorite piece must be Reconocidos, which translates to recognized. And it's a piece uh, inspired in the official and non-official death tolls. You're going to see numbers on the piece, and those are in relation to the uh, official and non-official death tolls given by the government or studies made. The official death toll is over 3,000 people. And the government, when President Trump came in, our governor, Ricardo Rosselló, very proudly said that we only had 16 deaths. Like one six, 16? Yeah, 16, oh, less oh. than 20, 16. Okay. And it was over 3,000. And most of the deaths are because of the lack of response. No power. So hospitals had no power. People that were connected to machines, no power. Dialysis patients without power. I mean, most of the deaths were because of the lack of response from the governments. So the, your artwork and your life is all about resilience. You also opened up the Mar, you know, Mara Art Studio and Gallery in the middle of a pandemic. So that's, you know, that's a story of resilience in itself. And when you look back at your life or your art, is there a piece of a story of resilience that you would like to share with us? There's a lot of stories on resilience because I think Puerto Ricans, we are taught to be resilient. We have to be resilient because of our colonial relationship with the United States. So that's part of the nature of who we are. We are resilient people. But from my personal stories, I would say Hurricane Maria, uh, because it completely uprooted my life and my family's life. I moved from the very successful career that I had into moved out of Puerto Rico, moved my immediate family, just the four of us, to Sarasota. We have no family here, it's just the four of us, starting from zero. So that starting from zero, I would say, has to be my number one resilient story. Coming here, starting all over again, my husband starting all over again. I, and then when we're finally opening up a business here, the pandemic hits. Uh, and then everything, our plans changed with the pandemic and I just opened the, uh, the art gallery. It was supposed to be a larger business. And then I opened in the Rosemary District in the middle of the pandemic. And then we went through Hurricane Ian, um, where, uh, we had to get a new roof in our house. Uh, but for us, for example, we never lost power during Hurricane Ian, even though we were losing our, our roof. So it was nerve wracking for us, but we still had power. We had Wi-Fi and we were like, this is just bizarre. So that was another story. I mean, it just keeps going on and on. And then I mean, like establishing the Rosemary District, and my lease went up 75%. So once again, let's move and start from zero mm -hmm. on Palm Ave, which I'm very happy that was a blessing in disguise. Yeah, you're in an amazing location. It's an amazing right location. Now. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So <clears throat> like going off of the this level of resi resilience that you have to you know maintain, could you talk about some of the challenges of the type of work that you do? And not just like, 
you know, as a, you know, a, a gallery owner, but a female identifying artist from Puerto Rico, being a gallery owner um, in Sarasota. So being a little geographically specific. So there's, there's a lot of challenges that we already spoke about. The constant question of where I'm from because of my accent. I also get a lot of reactions, people being surprised when I say I am Mara and I point to the window because my name's on the window and I get like, oh, you're Mara, right? So I'm always wondering, is it because I look young? Is it because of my accent? Is it because I'm a woman in business? But I get that reaction a lot. In terms of my work, the work that I am most passionate about is the work that can be recognized as a hard seller, but it's the work that I'm not gonna stop creating. At the same time, I own a business on Palm Avenue, so I have to keep the doors open. And in order to keep the doors open, I have to sell. So the challenge, some of the challenges would be like a compromise? like It is, them. and not, not just for me, there's other artists and it's mostly Latin artists whose work is not the selling work, whether it's for social reasons or political reasons. But it is the work that we are deeply passionate about. So do you feel like the voices of Latin artists are fully represented in the arts? I believe they are not, especially in Sarasota. When you go around the galleries, it's mostly American artists, and it's nothing wrong with that. But there's people from all over the world living here. And uh, there's people from all over the world living here, and you don't see a lot of Latin artists in the galleries. Why do you think that, like, is, why do you think that is? I don't know why. I know that in my gallery, I am trying to bring in more international talent. Right now I have, including myself, it's three Puerto Ricans. I have one Canadian, uh, the rest are Americans. But I'm trying to bring in, oh, I have one uh, Colombian who has been at the gallery for less than two weeks and three of his pieces have sold Congratulations. Thank you. Wow. So his work has been very well received here. That's so wonderful. we're four Latin artists in the gallery. But I have to say that I have more female artists than male artists in the gallery. And that's part of my mission. To highlight um, the voices of you know, female Females. identifying artists in the in the business, which is which is extremely important. From your perspective then, you know, being from Puerto Rico and yes. um, being a woman in the arts, um, what can be what can be done in order to create more inclusion in the arts? Both the art organizations, whether it's whether we're talking about galleries or we're talking about museums, they should be more inclusive with Latin artists. But also the Latin artists have, at some point, they have to put their work out. Not all of them do. The Latin artists also have to reach out and put their work out. But it feels, for some of them, based on conversations we've had, they have reached out at some point and they have not been included. So I know that for some of them it's hard, but you still have to do your part. So you both have to do their part. So I'm trying to be more inclusive of everyone, regardless of where you're from. That's why I'm bringing in more Latin artists into my own space and more female artists into my space. Mm -hmm. it, it, you know, going back to like the compromise, right? Because it sounds like the challenge that you you face is a similar challenge that other Latin artists also right, might face in the sense of creating work for themselves, like for a social or political, you know, like 
drive and then creating work that sells. And I'm interested because you just mentioned that you have, uh, I'm sorry, Col uh, Col the Colombian artist, right? Yes. And they, this person has sold two pieces. Like what is, what is the, what is the outlier in that situation? Like, is it the type of work that is, um, is it like the like a promote like commercial piece? Is it a commercial piece that educates people? Who's who's the type of who's the the buyer or like the demographic of the purchaser of you know these types of pieces? Like where can we bridge the gap? Because it sounds like it's an educational thing. It sounds like people, if they were more informed on you know this level of resiliency that Puerto Ricans have, and then when they see pieces on resiliency from a Puerto Rican artist, they might be more inclined to support that artist because they can relate to, you know, this level of oppression or like just they can relate to Puerto Ricans who feel that way. Like, I feel like, do you feel like the what the difference is or what could bridge it is a, a, a sense of education? And if so, like how, like I mean, spitballing ideas, what type of ways could we educate the masses so they are more appreciative of the art that the Latin culture produces? That is a great question because when I evaluate Aurelio Posada, which is the Colombian artist, he is also an architect. His work does not have a social or political story behind it. I am very happy to include Latin artists regardless of if their work is social, political, or commercial. But when I look at the other three Puerto Rican artists, including myself, our work is mostly social, political, and does not sell as much as, or as fast as, Aurelio's work, or commercial work. I think people either are afraid of it, or don't understand it, or are simply not interested in it. I had a piece by Javi Suarez, who's a Puerto Rican artist, also an architect in town. He's been in Sarasota since the 80s, on Ruth Bader. And I had one customer, female customer, walk in, she was walking around the gallery, pointed at that painting and said, you shouldn't be showing that. For me, coming from a female, that was uh, appalling, right? And I didn't say anything because of, I am the business owner and I should just, but it's, it's that type of work, the one that it's not always well perceived here. But I really agree with you. The arts has such an important role in educating the masses um, and then creating awareness on a lot of the issues that um, you know many people are not necessarily aware of that's where really like intercultural learning happens and this is this is something that I talk to my you know students all the time because in order you know for us to have any sort of like empathy with people that we need to like recognize that there are all these stories that are really impacting people because whenever we talk about you know, human rights or issues of, you know, racism. Sometimes they they could feel like these these topics are controversial, these topics are political, these topics, even like death tolls are just like abstract numbers that are out there that we read about on the newspapers. But when we have people in front of us and we're hearing these stories, these real stories from their mouth, and we're really like learning the impact of, wow, these are real issues impacting real people. It goes back to the lack of education. In Puerto Rico, for example, where, where I went to school to, uh, I was taught both English and Spanish since I was in preschool. So most of the Puerto Ricans are bilingual. Here in the States, it's English, unless you are interested in learning a second language, but you're not taught a second language. In Puerto Rico, I was taught about the United States and the rest of the world. And I still don't understand how here they're not taught about the relationship between the United States and Puerto Rico. How we are still, we're the oldest colony, oldest existing colony in the world. We are American citizens because we were granted citizenship 
but we don't have the same rights as US citizens. And I get that from all the questions from different people that they don't know. When you're asking when I became a US citizen, it's because you were never taught, educated on that relationship between the United States and Puerto Rico. When we're talking about politics, the majority of the people here don't know, like I mentioned earlier, that we have to pay federal taxes, but we don't vote for president. We don't have the right to vote for president, but yet the United States owns us. So it goes back to that lack of education. Mm -hmm. And that's, we're just talking about Puerto Rico, United States, but that, it goes beyond that. Yeah, um, and, and Curtis, you, because I'm, I'm originally from Turkey, and, and, and I think I, I, I mentioned this, and Turkey is a very homogenous region, and I know that, Curtis, you have this fascinating story interacting with a student from Turkey, and you were able to turn that into an educational moment for that student. You know, <clears throat> I don't know if I... You make it sound like I was I was aware in that situation, so I, I definitely think like space and room to grow. To you need, in order to grow, there needs to be space allotted out so that it, conversations can happen, so that you know people can be educated and then they can understand where the work comes from. You know, unless you have that exposure, they're not going to know to ask those questions. Like when, when I was. Uh, I can't believe I'm telling the story. So when I was <clears throat> entering my second year here at Ringling, we, it's a very, it's a cultural melting pot and people, like I met people from parts of the world I didn't even know existed, right? I'm from Ohio. When am I gonna ever talk about the Maldives, right? Um, but my second year, I had, we were a group of friends and we were just hanging out and we had met a young lady from Turkey and we were, you know, a friend of mine and I are just kind of talking we're in this big group and she comes out of nowhere and she walks up and she like grabs my nose and she said her thought out loud and she goes, wow, it's soft. And I was, we're all just kind of like taken back. And, you know, I'd been here for a year. So understanding like different cultures and different people allowed me to make room for a, a random encounter in a way without knowing that it did. Um, and so asking her like, yo, you can't just walk up to someone and just invade their space. But for her, she, her interaction with a black person was that of like a different social class. And so she really hadn't had the opportunity to be in the same space where there, it wasn't even like dawned on that we were different. We were just existing in the same group of friends. And so she had that space to do so, and then we also all had that space to create this educational moment out of a random encounter of someone grabbing my nose. But I feel like, in a way, like Sarasota could, there needs some more bandwidth. There needs to be some more growth so that people from you know your culture can have that those types of conversations and that people can listen. They may not respond the way you want to respond. I don't, you know, I think that's human, but given the room, an educational moment can be presented in those spaces. And I think, you know, those spaces probably need to be curated a little bit more in certain areas of the country than they would in others. But that doesn't mean that they don't, they should not exist. You know what I mean? That reminds me of, I think we talked about this, how everyone points out how exotic my daughter is. And they're always pointing out the gorgeous skin color both of my kids have. Like, I'm not pointing out your skin color ever. I'm not saying, well, you're exotic. You're gorgeous because you're exotic. And it's stuff like that that just stays in your head. And you try to analyze where these comments and questions are, are definitely coming from. And uh, another thing, I have an accent, clearly. My husband does not have an accent. So they ask him a lot, where did you learn English? Puerto Rico. How long have you been here? Five and a half years. Wow. It's like, really? <laughs> but then I get a lot of, where are you from because of the accent? And then he gets the, wow, because he does not have an accent. Mm. So 
you know, you're an artist, um, you know, Puerto Rico, you're a woman and you're also a mother, right? So you have all of these like really amazing experiences. You went through a, um, you know, humanitarian crisis in, in, in Puerto Rico, went through two hurricanes. Um, so if you were to give a piece of advice to young people like our students, what piece of advice would you give? My advice would be stay true to yourselves, to your work, and don't fear being who you are and speaking up and having a voice. If possible, don't think about if your work is gonna sell commercially, because I think art is great channel to educate others. And through art, you can express what you can't with words, which is part of my, my statement. Where is your gallery located? Just in case, you know, some people in the community would like yeah. to come and stop by, like where, where exactly downtown Sarasota are you? The name of my gallery is Mara Art Studio and Gallery. It's located in 76 South Palm Avenue and you can find us online on Facebook, Instagram, or our website, marastudiogallery.com. Sounds wonderful. Thank you so much. And that concludes today's conversation. Thank you for tuning in and joining us on this journey of design and inclusion. You can find all of our episodes, transcripts, and other wonderful resources on our website, ringling.edu backslash rising together. Join us next time for more insightful conversations. And remember to stay connected, stay engaged, and keep rising together with us. Rising Together is produced at the Soundstage in partnership with Studio Labs and Art Network at Ringling College of Art and Design. The show is produced by Dr. Elson Haskeller, Curtis Anderson, Keith Elliott, Nick Paldino, Troy Logan, and Marquis Doyle.